Good morning. You'll find uh, the notes this morning's message in the bulletin. Please turn your Bible. It's all the way back to the Old Testament. Hitch that back up. We're going back to the Old Testament, the book of Habakkuk, the minor prophet. And this morning, we're going to do an overview and introduction to Habakkuk. Only three chapters long, easy to miss. You may need to sing through that Bible verse song in your mind to find where it is. So I'll give you an extra minute or two to turn there. And yet I trust that our study of this book over the next few weeks, five, maybe six weeks total, will be profitable. I think there's much here for us. We know from Second Timothy that all Scripture is inspired of God and profitable. There's profit in the book of Habakkuk. And there's, I think you'll see by the end of our time this morning, uh, much that can, we can learn and be encouraged by. Normally I'll read a passage of Scripture and then open in prayer, but let's just open in prayer right now and then we will move on. Lord God, as we turn our eyes to your word, I pray that you'd give us insight. These words written over 2,500 years ago are still your word, living and active. They will not return void. They will accomplish the purpose for which you have appointed them. And Lord, as you have revealed yourself and your plans and your dealings to the prophet Habakkuk and to your people, I pray our, I pray our understanding and apprehension of you would grow, our trust and confidence in you would deepen, um, that we would um, find greater security certainty in this world um, as, as we trust in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Now hopefully you're at Habakkuk, <clears throat> and we're going to cover this in three points. We're going to look at the introduction, deal with at least one interpretive issue, cover an outline, and then I hope to read the book. It's, it takes about nine minutes to read Habakkuk. It is a rather short book, three chapters. Um, three chapters. And it's consists as of a dialogue, Habakkuk bringing a complaint or a problem to the Lord, the Lord responding, Habakkuk taking that in and giving a response to that, the Lord responding, and then chapter 3 is a psalm composed by Habakkuk for, for Israel corporately to sing. That's the nature of the book. Question, answer, question, answer, psalm. It's, it's pretty straightforward in that sense. So let's dive in. Habakkuk we know very little about. Um, other than his reference here, we, we don't know what tribe he's from. We don't know um, what function he had in the society. His name means to embrace, and some have suggested this means something like comfort, although his message, while it has comfort, is also one of judgment. Little is known about him at all. One thing we can glean, if you turn to chapter 3, is he's familiar with the temple worship, the, con the construction of psalms, and has a musical familiarity. If you look at 3.1, a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet according to Shigianoth. That's a liturgical musical term. Some have suggested possibly he may have been a Levite. It, it's possible, by no means certain. But he had familiarity with musical instruments. If you look at the end of verse 19, to the choir master with stringed instruments, he had not just composed the, the lyric, the text of the psalm, but he was familiar enough with, with the performance of musical instruments to give that type of instruction. So possibly, um, possibly a Levite, but by no means certain. The book also doesn't tell us when it was written. Some of the uh, minor prophets, most notably our, our study of Zechariah, had a really nice time stamp. So we've got to try to place where this book takes place in Israel's history. And at a sort of meta level, we can sort of figure it out, I think, um, about 605 BC. And the basis of that is as follows. Habakkuk is written predicting Babylon, the Chaldeans, coming and, and taking the, the two southern tribes. So we know it has to be before that. And the exile of Israel, the southern two tribes of Judah, is in 686 BC. It's also likely after the fall of Nineveh. We also know that um, Josiah was one of the last good kings of Israel, and the context of Habakkuk is of nationwide apostasy, corruption, and evil. Doesn't seem to be a good fit for Manasseh. So written around 605 BC, um, likely during the reign of Jehoiakim. 
Jehoiakim. And we're going to quickly turn to uh, 2 Kings. Give you an idea of who this guy is. The king, I believe, at the time of Habakkuk. If you remember, a simple way of thinking about this, the, the kingdom only has, is only unified for three kings. Saul, David, and Solomon. And then under Solomon's son, it's divided in two. And the ten northern tribes pretty much have terrible kings the whole way through until Shalmaneser comes in and takes them away. And the southern kingdom is spotty, mostly bad kings, some decent kings, Manasseh being one of the last decent kings. And we get an idea of of who Jehoiakim is. His original name, his birth name was Eliakim. In 2 Kings 23. Let's, uh, hold on. There we go. 2 Kings 23. In verse 34. Pharaoh Necho made Eliakim, the son of Josiah, king in the place of Josiah, his father, and changed his name to Jehoiakim. If you're wondering how to spell that for the blank, there you go. You're welcome. Um, you jump down to verse 36. Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Zabida, the daughter of Pediah of Rumah, and he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his fathers had done. In his days, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up, and Jehoiakim became his servant for three years. Then he turned and rebelled against him, and the Lord sent against him bands of the Chaldeans, and the bands of Syrians, and the bands of the Moabites, and bands of the Ammonites, and sent them against Judah to destroy it, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by his servant and the prophets. Surely this came upon Judah at the command of the Lord to remove them out of his sight for the sins of Manasseh according to all that he had done, and also for the innocent blood that had been shed, for he filled Jerusalem with innocent blood, and the Lord would not pardon. So Jehoiakim is a bad king, and God is going to judge Israel for him and the other kings before him. Actually, I should say Judah. When the nations split, Israel refers normally to the ten northern tribes. So likely during his reign, he's the king reigning in Jeremiah 1.3 when Jeremiah begins his ministry. Um, and during the rise of the Chaldeans to power. The Chaldeans are the Babylonians. And it's interesting that Babylon, really, the nation of Babylon, bookends the Bible. It shows up in Genesis chapter 11, where the Tower of Babel is made, and in contrast to these people who want to make a name for themselves that is great, God picks Abram and says, I'll make your name great. So there's a clear contrast between Abram and the nations that will descend from him and these people trying to make a name for themselves. And then, all the way at the end of the book of Revelation, who shows up again but Babylon? And you'd, uh, if you're in Dave Lample's class, you are hearing or will continue to hear much about that. And so Babylon, the Chaldeans, same name, same thing, is this enemy of Israel. They're going to be God's tool of judgment. Um, They're going to be described in the book of Habakkuk. So by putting those two things together, it has to be after Josiah, has to be before the captivity, 605-ish is probably right, so 605 years-ish before the coming of Christ, which means... 2,600 years from us, which makes this an old text. And yet, God's word is profitable for his people. I'd like to then suggest six major topics or themes in the book as we study through this that will hopefully show some of that usefulness. Some of that usefulness. Now, normally the prophet goes and speaks to the people for God. But in this book, what you have is the prophet talking to God. And then God responds to the prophet corporately. So even though Habakkuk's complaint is individual, there's no indication other people have put him up to making this request. God's response, if you're now back in Habakkuk, starting in verse 5, are using plural verbs. You all look among the nations. You all see. You all wonder. So it's clear that even though Habakkuk's complaint is individual, 
He's not speaking for a group of people. The Lord's response to Habakkuk is corporate. He intends others to hear this. And that becomes clear in chapter 2. Look over at chapter 2, starting in verse 2, where the Lord commands him to write it down as a record. And the Lord answered me, write the vision, make it plain on tablets, so he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Which also further indicates that Habakkuk is is prophesying, and this is taking place right before the Chaldeans are going to come in, right before Nebuchadnezzar will arrive. It's, It's going to be soon. It's imminent. And so a prophet speaks to God with his vexation of spirit, with his complaint was troubling him. The Lord responds, and Habakkuk gets more troubled by that response, and that leads him to speak again, and then God speaks again, and then Habakkuk composes a psalm of worship, and the book ends. That, that's the book. So what does this book deal with? Why might this be um, encouraging or instructive for us? Well, the first theme or topic in the book is just the general pain and anguish over pervasive injustice in the land. Habakkuk's first complaint centers on that. Just just look, starting in chapter 1, verse 2. O Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? Or cry to you violence and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity? And why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed and justice never goes forth for the wicked surround the righteous. So justice goes forth perverted. If I'm right, that this is in the time of Jehoiakim, then the entire worship structure of Israel is compromised. It's not just that evil people are prospering, but the justice system itself, the throne and the worship is corrupt at every level of society. You could use the term systemic, Injustice is what is going on around Habakkuk, and it grieves him. This is a book dealing with grief over societal sin, societal degradation. Particularly painful after the apparent hopeful return to form under Josiah. And now, no, back to idolatry, back to injustice, back to bloodshed. And Habakkuk is is grieved in his heart as he looks around his country that he loves, and he sees its degradation, corruption, its wickedness, its injustice. It's right to be grieved by those things. There's one possible point of connection. I know some of you may share that sentiment to some degree or another. Next, we have vexation over God's apparent inactivity. Vexation over God's apparent inactivity. We saw that also in the passage. Why aren't you doing anything? Sometimes we can be tempted to think that we're more concerned than God is about what's going on. And and, and Habakkuk is flummoxed. He knows what the law says. He knows what the law says about what God delights in, what the Lord loves, what he requires. And he knows the Lord has to see it far more clearly than he does. And if it's clear to me, why aren't you doing something, O Lord? That's his, his vexation. And again... I, a lot of times in pastoral counseling, people's impatience, their frustration, their difficulty, why is God not acting? Why is he not stopping this great evil? That's, that's his basic first question. Why aren't you doing anything? Habakkuk deals with that theme. Which also means, again, keep in mind that God is expecting, by giving this book to his people, these are themes and questions he expects many of his children to be wrestling with and asking. Here's good medicine for all of us who've been vexed by evil around us and the appearance of God's inactivity. Third, confusion over God's use of evil as a tool of his discipline. See, God's answer, Habakkuk says to him, why do you make me see iniquity, right, in verse 3? Look at verse 5. God tells him, I got something for you to see, all right. Look and see what I'm doing. God has not been inactive. God is not sitting idly by. He's been busy strengthening and raising up a wicked and corrupt people. 
Look among the nations and see. Wonder and be astounded. For I'm doing a work in your day that you would not believe if told. For behold, I'm raising up the Chaldeans. That bitter and hasty nation who marched through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. And the Lord's response, which is, oh, I'm well aware, Habakkuk, and I am doing something, is not what Habakkuk had in mind. (laughs) I imagine Habakkuk was hoping for reform, for correction, possibly some chastisement, but not the removal from the land, not being conquered by a foreign nation, and particularly a foreign nation as wicked as the Babylonians were. We just got to pause. I know many of you love your country, your homeland. Habakkuk's just been told a foreign pagan invader, wicked, terrible, fierce, will be taking over them and taking them off the land. And he, he wrestles with how can God do that? That's the nature of his second complaint. If you look down in verse 13 of chapter 1. You who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong, why do you look idly? Why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? Lord, how is it that you who are holy and pure can use a more wicked nation, Babylon, to judge an admittedly wicked but less comparatively wicked than Babylon nation such as Israel? How can God make use of evil people? I've raised Pharaoh up, the Lord says, without getting his own hands dirty. We're dealing with the problem of evil, God's relationship to it. We're dealing with the fact that sometimes God judges a nation by raising up an even more wicked nation to take them and conquer them. And that troubles Habakkuk. Sometimes God's response is not what we hoped it would be. And, and Habakkuk really wrestles with this. is the major theme, Lord. Why aren't you doing anything? And then when he finds out what God is doing, how, how does that work, Lord? Confusion over God's use of evil as his tool of discipline. Habakkuk also has another central theme in, in uh, chapter 2, verse 4. This is the most quoted verse in the New Testament of Habakkuk. And that is that the righteous shall live by faith. The righteous shall live by faith. By faith, quoted in Romans 1.17, Galatians 3.11, Hebrews 10.38. This is Paul's proof of justification by faith. As Paul wants to make clear that we have a right standing before God, not because of the things we do, the rituals we partake in, the good works that we live out day by day. Rather, the righteous shall live by his faith, as quoted right here. Now, the contrast in 2.4 is compared to the proud Babylonians. Because God's answer to the second question when he says, how can you do this, is to say, don't worry, Habakkuk. I'm going to discipline Babylon for daring to touch you. I mean, God is, I think, going to get bigger in your eyes as we look at this book. God says, yes, I'm aware of Israel's sin. I am raising up Babylon to be my instrument, my hammer of judgment on Israel. And then, when that is complete, I'm going to turn around and judge Babylon for taking the credit to themselves. That's the charge against them. Look at verse 11. Guilty men whose own might is their God. What they worshipped, what they trusted in, was their strength. They're taking the credit. They, Nebuchadnezzar is, is the poster child of this. He's walking along the walls of Babylon. Look at this empire. Look at what I have done. They don't know they're God's instrument. They're not giving God glory or credit. They're taking the credit, and God will smash them for that. God gets to be God. So God can raise up an evil nation, put them in a position of ability, strength, and power, use them as his tool of discipline, and then turn around and judge them for what they did. Because they didn't do it for his glory. They didn't do it giving him credit. They did it taking credit to themselves. And that vexes Habakkuk, just as I know it vexes us. We're going to have to wrestle with this. But God gets to be God. He gets to rule and be sovereign. 
These, these are the themes Habakkuk deals with. And I think in a chaotic and difficult world, it's, it's good to be reminded of these things again. Point five, another theme, is the confidence that God will judge the wicked nations, even those whom he has raised up. Most of chapter 2, starting in, in verse 6, is given over to five triplet verses of woes. Verse 6, woe to him who heaps up what is not his own. Verse 9, woe to him who gets evil gain for his house. Verse 12, woe to him who builds a town with bloodshed. Verse 15, woe to him who makes his neighbor drink. Verse 19, woe to him who says to a wooden thing, awake to a silent stone, arise. And what you've got in verses 6 through 20 are all the reasons... God is provoked to anger to judge Babylon from their pride to their treatment of others to their worshiping of their own strength and culminating in their overt idolatry. God will strike them down. We get a grand exposition. Habakkuk should have no doubt. We should have no doubt. God will judge the earth. And even if for a time he raises up an evil people for his purposes, they will not escape justice. They will not escape justice. Habakkuk gives us the message that we can be confident that whatever injustices are taking place now, they will be righted. The the God of this world is aware, is watching, and he will give a reckoning that will leave us satisfied. That will leave us satisfied. And finally, um, seen most clearly in in his psalm, is... Trust and joy in the Lord's mercy and grace, even in the midst of his painful discipline. Habakkuk evidences the faith that his book commends. Even in the first announcement of God's judgment, he bursts forth in verse 12. Are you not from everlasting? Oh, sorry, chapter 112. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord, my Holy One? We shall not die. Which is Habakkuk is saying, even as he's just been told, I'm raising up that hasty and terrible nation, the Chaldeans, to come and judge you. He knows God's promises from of old. And he knows whatever this means, it does not mean the ultimate final termination of the nation of Israel. He's he's trusting that this will be painful. This will be difficult. But this is discipline and it's not the end. He's trusting in God's mercy and grace. One of my favorite passages in the Bible is at the end of chapter 3. It's not that Habakkuk necessarily fully synthesizes everything. One of the things I hope you'll see at the end of our study is that wrestling with the problem of evil and God's use of evil people and evil nations, our vexation, our grief, seeing evil around us, it's not that the Lord expects us to perfectly understand how it all works and what he's doing. We're not expected to know that. What we are expected to do is to trust that he knows what he's doing. And to be able to worship and give thanks and rejoice, even in our, I'm not sure what God's doing or why he's doing it, but I know he's good. Look look at these verses. I love this. 17, 18, and 19. Actually, go back back to 16. 316 through the end. I hear and my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters into my bones My legs tremble beneath me, yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon people who invade us. He's processing the news that the Chaldeans are going to win. Jerusalem's going down. The nation's going into exile. And that he equates to rottenness entering his bones. And yes, there's some comfort in knowing that those who destroy them, will themselves be destroyed. And he will wait for that. But here's his final conclusion. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the field yields no food. And flocks be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Which in an agrarian society means no food, no produce, no money, no income, starvation. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. 
God, the Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. Which is to say, even when all my hopes for in this world, all the things I want in this world, I want a harvest. I want fruit on the vine. I want to eat, to live, to survive. Certainly the announcement of Babylon's judgment was not what Habakkuk wanted. I'm going to rejoice and delight in God even when the things I most want and look for in this world do not come. That, that's the just living by faith. And that's what God would have us do in response to the evil around us. Ultimately, the synthesis has got to be he knows what he's doing, and I'm going to trust in him. I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. Those are the, those six themes. I originally had a list that was nine long, and I was able to trim it down some, are, are the main themes and topics the book deals with. And we're going to move through somewhat quickly. Each answer, question and answer, question and answer. And it's only going to take us about five weeks after this to get through the entirety of Habakkuk. That's my plan, at least. Which then brings us to an interpretive issue, interpretive issues. And this, this needs to be emphasized. Israel, as a nation, is unique in human history. Israel is the only nation in human history that is personally entered into a covenant relationship with the living God. Turn, if you will, to Deuteronomy 28. Unlike every other nation was in a covenant with God. Deuteronomy 28. The Lord's punishment for Israel was not arbitrary or creative. It was predicted. The end of Deuteronomy, remember Moses is near the Jordan, he's going to die, and the generation, the children of those who perished in the wilderness are going to go in and take possession of the land. He reiterates, that's where the Deuteronomos, the second law, a repetitional law, title comes from. And he's reminding them of the commitment they made with the Lord God, and he's reminded them of the, the stakes. Um, we, we considered the new covenant um, just a few weeks ago. And one of the distinctions between the new covenant and the old covenant is the old covenant was what we say bilateral. Do these good things. Keep your end of the bargain. God does these things. Blessings. Be faithless. Break your end of the bargain. And God brings cursings. And we made the observation that the new covenant gives what it requires It requires faith and faithfulness, and it gives new hearts and new minds and faithfulness. So there will be none in the new covenant who do not know the Lord, for he will be gracious to all of them, from the least of them to the greatest. And our sins he will not remember. But under the Mosaic law, you could be in covenant with God and faithless. And so in Deuteronomy 28, he lays out at the end of the book, here are the blessings, here are the cursings. Just read with me. Deuteronomy 28, 1. And if you faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandments that I command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth, and all the blessings shall come upon you and overtake you. That's that's some wonderfully picturesque language. The blessings are just going to overtake you. You'll be surrounded by blessings. If you obey the voice of the Lord your God, blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the field, and blessed shall be the fruit of your womb, and the fruit of your ground, and the fruit of your cattle, and the increase of your herds, and among your flock. The very things Habakkuk listed at the end of chapter 3. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be when you come in, and blessed shall you be when you go out. The Lord will cause your enemies who rise against you to be defeated before you. They shall come out against you one way and flee before you seven ways. The Lord will command the blessings on you in your barns and in all you undertake. And he will bless you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. The Lord will establish you as a people holy to himself as he has sworn to you. If you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways. So pause. The Lord has just promised economic prosperity fruitfulness for themselves and geopolitical security. 
Whatever nations might try to rise up against you, you're going to rout them. They're going to run in terror seven different ways. Now, those promises were given to Israel. And what I mean to say is that there are no similar promises to other nations. A faithful, covenant-keeping Israel should expect to be military victorious. Which is why when Joshua goes out and battles Ai the first time and they get routed... He said, whoa, 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 what gives? Something's up because we're not supposed to lose. And the angel of the Lord, the commander of the Lord's army, comes and tells him, Joshua, there's sin in the camp. Achan kept some of the silver from Jericho. Because if Israel's faithful, God promises to be faithful and give them military victory. No other nation in the history of the world has that promise. America, France, Germany, Sweden could be as faithful as as anything, and not be guaranteed military victory or successes. Israel, and Israel alone, was in a covenant relationship with God. Notice also the the curses now. God promised blessings upon their faithfulness. God promised cursings upon their faithlessness. He picks that up starting in verse 15. We won't read all of this, but here's here's the rub. But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord your God, Or be careful to do all his commandments and his statutes that I command you today. Then all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. Cursed shall you be in the city. And cursed shall you be in the field. Cursed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Cursed shall be the fruit of your womb and the fruit of the ground. And the increase of the herds and the young of your flock. Cursed shall you be when you come in. And cursed shall you be when you go out. The Lord will send on you curses, confusion, and frustration in all that you undertake to do until you are destroyed and perish quickly on account of the evil of your deeds because you have forsaken me. Just cut down to um, verse 32. Your sons and your daughters shall be given to another people while your eyes look upon the f- look on and fail with longing for them all day long. For you should be helpless. A nation that you have not known shall eat up the fruit of your ground and all your labors, and you shall be o- and you shall be only oppressed and crushed continually, so that you are driven mad by the sights that your eyes see. The Lord will strike you on the knees and on the legs with grievous boils of which you cannot be healed from the sole of your foot to the head of your crown. The Lord will bring you and your king whom you set over you to a nation that neither you nor your fathers have known. And there you shall serve other gods of wood and stone and you shall become a horror, a proverb and a byword among all the peoples where the Lord your God shall lead you away. So what God is promising to do with Nebuchadnezzar is exactly what he said he would do. And Habakkuk understands the fittingness, the justice of this. This is the terrible judgment God said he would bring when Israel was faithless. So my point in bringing this up, point B here is this. All scripture is profitable for us. It's useful for us. But we're not always the immediate audience of it. When it becomes really obvious when God makes promises to individuals. When, when the Lord God promises Solomon, ask of me, what do you want? And Solomon, give me wisdom. God didn't make that promise to you. When God tells David he's going to build a house for him and raise up his offspring after him, that's not a direct promise to you. You sit on the sidelines and... Those promises to David and those promises to Solomon, they they have a trickle-down effect that eventually do reach you, but God hasn't made those promises to you. Well, here's here's my point. Neither the church nor the USA is Israel. We're not. Neither the church nor the USA is national Israel. If, If the church is faithful, God does not promise us military victory. You, you can try to spiritualize that and be like, well, well, victory is God's kingdom is taking place. This is about land with geographic boundaries and rivers and cities and towers and gates. And God has made promises to national Israel, and he's fulfilling the promises literally here. They're literally going to be taken captive to Babylon, just like he literally said they would. And so... We have to think carefully then what we can learn. The reason why I say that is this. 
if, if we don't consider that, we'll assume, hey, God judged Israel for their faithlessness. He's going to judge America. Or he's going to judge the church. He may, but God's timetable for judgment involves some really interesting factors. God was going to judge Israel sooner, but Hezekiah asked for a delay. So the Lord said, okay. Why, why did God send Israel down to Egypt? Because the sin of the Amorites was not yet fulfilled. They're not as wicked as they're going to get, and I want to let them go full bloom. Before I judge them, the Lord says. I wouldn't have expected that. So we learn from Habakkuk that God does deal nations, deal with nations. Babylon's not a covenant nation with God, and God's going to judge them. But his timetable and his purposes and how he chooses to act are his own business. That he does it, we see. If we start prognosticating on he's going to do it sooner or later, or this country, that country, I, we got to be careful. And we mustn't assume that we're Israel in this story. For all we know, we're Babylon. And God blessed us precisely because he wanted to use us to smash some other people. I don't know. We're not Israel. The church isn't Israel. So we do see, reading this, how God is faithful to his promises. We do see his heart for his people, and we are his people. But we need to keep that in mind, lest we put verses and promises to Israel, of my people who are called by my name. Go read that in context. It's the t- prayer of dedication for the temple that Solomon prayed, and God's response to it. And the people who are called by his name are a very particular people called Israel. Or I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, which is about the return from Babylon and the captivity. Now, yes, from those verses, we can see, look at God's compassionate heart for his people. Solomon pleads in prayer. He requests grace. The Lord says, yes, yes, that's my God. I know his character. Amen. But if you're going to quote, I know the plans I have for you, and you're not applying it to returning from Babylon, you've, uh, I, th- those dogs won't hunt for me, at least. I'll say that. There we go. Okay. Um, so we can learn stuff, but we've got to pause and just think through. We're, it's too easy. We're the heroes. We're the good guys. We're Israel. No, we're not. And Israel's not the good guys either. Um, so. Okay, that leads us then to just an outline of the book, and we're going to read the book, and we will have time for our closing song. Fantastic. I'd encourage you over the next few weeks to try to sit down and read Habakkuk through in one reading. You're going to see it takes anywhere from 8 to 12 minutes, depending on how quickly or slowly you read. And it really isn't that hard to follow the structure of the book. Habakkuk is burdened. There's a, there's a brief introduction in one one. An oracle or a burden that Habakkuk the prophet saw. And then in verses 2 to 4 is his basic complaint. What gives, Lord? I'm seeing evil and wickedness top to bottom in society. The people charged with dispensing law and justice are failing miserably. Consequently, the, the wicked surrounds the righteous. Why aren't you acting? Why aren't you doing something? Which then leads to the Lord's first answer in 5 to 11, which is to say, oh, I am doing something. And when you see what I'm doing, you're going to marvel. I'm raising up a nation to judge your nation. Which then leads to Habakkuk's second complaint. Which is, whoa, 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 whoa. How, how does that work? How, how do you, holy and pure and sinless God, use a wicked people to judge a less wicked people? Which brings us to the Lord's answer. The Lord's answer, you could have, if I was making my outline longer, be a sub-point. He, he announces that he will judge Babylon in um, 4 and 5. And then, starting in 6, he outlines extensively why. It, it takes the form of a taunting song sung by the nations around Babylon as they fall. He's going to spell out exactly why Babylon will be judged which then leads to chapter 3 in Habakkuk's psalm of submission and trust. He looks back to the majesty of God at Sinai, and he looks forward with hope and faith, and the book ends. Lord, why aren't you doing something? I am doing something. Lord, how is it that you're doing that? Don't worry, I'm going to deal with Babylon. I don't understand, but I'm going to hope in you. I'm going to trust in you. 
That's, that's the book of Habakkuk in simplicity. Let's just read it now and sing our closing song. The oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw. O oh Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? Or cry to you violence and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity and why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise, so the law is paralyzed. And justice never goes forth, for the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. Look among the nations and see. Wonder and be astounded. For I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. They are dreaded and fearsome. Their justice and dignity go forth before themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards, more fierce than the evening wolves. Their horsemen press proudly on. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle, swift to devour. They all come for violence, All their faces forward, they gather captives like sand. At kings they scoff, at rulers they laugh. They laugh at every fortress, for they pile up earth and take it. Then they sweep by like the wind and go on. Guilty men whose own might is their God. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We we shall not die O Lord, you've ordained them as judgment, and you, O rock, have established them for reproof. You who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong, why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? You make mankind like the fish of the sea, like crawling things that have no ruler. He brings them all up with a hook. He drags them off with his net. He gathers them in his dragnet, so he rejoices and is glad. Therefore, he sacrifices to his net and makes offerings to his dragnet. For by them he lives in luxury and his food is rich. Is he then to keep on emptying his net and mercilessly killing nations forever? I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. And the Lord answered me, write the vision, make it plain on tablets so he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him. But the righteous shall live by his faith. Moreover, wine is a traitor, an arrogant man who is never at rest. His greed is as wide as Sheol. Like death, he is never enough. He gathers for himself all nations and collects as his own all peoples. Shall not all these take up their taunt against him with scoffing and riddles for him and say, Woe to him who heaps up what is not his own. For how long? And loads himself with pledges. Will not your debtors suddenly arise? And those awake who will make you tremble. Then you will be spoiled for them because you have plundered many nations. All the remnants of the people shall plunder you. For the blood of man and the violence to the earth to the cities and all who dwell in them. Woe to him who gets evil gain for his house, to set his nest on high, to be safe from the reach of harm. You have devised shame for your house by cutting off many peoples and have forfeited your life. For the stone will cry out from the wall and the beam from the woodwork respond. Woe to him who builds a town with bloodshed and founds a city on iniquity. Behold, is it not from the Lord of hosts that peoples labor merely for fire and nations weary themselves for nothing? For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the water cover the sea. Woe to him who makes his neighbor drink to pour out your wrath and make them drunk in order to gaze at their nakedness. 
You shall have your fill of shame instead of glory. Drink yourself and show your uncircumcision. The cup in the Lord's right hand will come around to you, and utter shame will come upon your glory. The violence done to Lebanon will overwhelm you, as will the destruction of the beasts that terrified them. For the blood of man and the violence to the earth, the cities and all who dwell in them. What profit is an idol when its maker has shaped it? A metal image, a teacher of lies. For its maker trusts in his own creation when he makes speechless idols. Woe to him who says to a wooden thing, awake to a silent stone, arise. Can this teach? Behold, it's overlaid with gold and silver and there is no breath at all in it. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. A prayer of Habakkuk the prophet, according to Shigianoth. O Lord, I have heard the report of you. In your work, O Lord, do I fear. In the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. God came from Teman, and the Holy One from Mount Paran, Salah. His splendor covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise. His brightness was like the light rays flashing from his hand. And there he veiled his power. Before him went pestilence, and plague followed at his heels. He stood and measured the earth. He looked and shook the nations. Then the eternal mountains were scattered. The everlasting hills sank low. His were the everlasting ways. I saw the tents of Kishon and affliction. The curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. Was your wrath against the rivers, O Lord? Was your anger against the rivers or your indignation against the sea when you rode on your horses, on your chariot of salvation? You stripped the sheaf from your bow, calling for many arrows, and you split the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and writhed, and raging waters swept on. The deep gave forth its voice. It lifted up its hands on high. The sun and moon stood still in their place at the light of your arrows as they sped at the flash of your glittering spear. You marched through the earth in fury. You threshed the nations in anger. You went out for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. You crushed the head of the house of the wicked laying him bare from high thigh to neck. You pierced with his own arrows the heads of his warriors who came like a whirlwind to scatter me, rejoicing as if to devour the poor in secret. You trampled the sea with your horses, the surging of mighty waters. I hear my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters into my bones. My legs tremble beneath me, yet... I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon people who invade us. Though the fig tree should not blossom nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail and the fields yield no food. The flock be cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. To the choir master with stringed instruments. I'm going to invite the worship team up as we have a closing word of prayer. Lord God, this prophecy, 2,600 years old, I pray that you would help us to profit from it that you would give the increase, that we might see that you will judge the earth in righteousness, that you do not sit idly by, and yet your ways are not our ways, and your judgments are not our judgments, and at times, Lord, they confound us. They undo us. Give us the faith to hope and trust in you, even when we do not understand. Give us the faith to take joy in you, even in your discipline. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.